Kenya. I'm the creative director for Iconic Images. And uh, thank you all for coming today to the Bowie 75 store uh, as part of our series of talks with photographers. Um, as always, a big thank you for the people behind the scenes and in front of the scenes, especially here in London. Uh, it's a great team and it's a, it's a real honor to do these events. Uh, speaking of honors, it's lovely today to be with the one and only Jeff McCormack. Um, so we're going to have a nice little conversation about you, your life, your work, and of course your collaboration with uh, Long Basically Friends. what she's trying to say is that she has to ask a 74-year-old man <laughs> what he did 50 years ago <laughs> when he was stoned. So, <laughs> So good luck. I really just good want to ask about the jumpsuits and how you got in them. Um, well, let's just kick it off. Tell me, uh, how did you meet David? Uh, I think probably most of you know that uh, David uh, lived in Bromley in Kent, which was uh, the, the suburbs. And uh, we would have been eight years of age. And we were both born uh, in 1947. And 1947 was two years after the Second World War. So we were still rationed. Uh, when we were kids, we were still on rations. So the, the country was a very different place. It was very grey. And the only chink of light came from your part of the world, Carrie, came from America. Um, via its, its, its fashion and its music. The, the, the buildings in London weren't cleaned up until the 70s and they were covered in soot and whatever, whatever. Everybody dressed, oh, I'm dressed that way. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> everybody dressed in dark clothes. And it, it was a grey world. So uh, when David's father bought him, David's father worked for Dr. Bernardo's, and uh, he had access to new music from America. And uh, David had a little Danzette record player, and um, we'd listen to Elvis Presley, um, Fats Domino, um, not Bill Haley, he wasn't cool. <laughs> yeah. Because although he was maybe late thirties, he looked like fifty with a silly kiss girl, and that didn't, that wasn't rock and roll, that, and that wasn't that didn't scream rebellion, either. But little Richard, that's that's rebellion, and that was Americana, and that was new, and that was like a thunderbolt. Um, everybody wanted to be Elvis Presley. Um, David wanted to be Little Richard, <laughs> which I think he achieved to a certain degree. I think so, especially in the style and the energy and the just the performance aspect. So music really is what bonded you guys. Uh, yeah, music was what b b bonded us. Uh, I had a brother the same age as, as, as David's brother. So that introduction was uh, into to, to jazz. So, um, in those days, people were, you were either a teddy boy or a modernist. And modernists were very serious and they uh, dressed in Italian clothes, Italian suits, uh, short hair, and carried around Dave Brubeck albums. <laughs> and Riding around with your Vespas. <laughs> yes. No, that was later, that was, that was the first generation of mods, not to be confused with modernists. Modern. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, and there were beatniks, which was cheaper to get in because you, all you needed was a big oversized sweater. Uh, and teddy boys, which was uh, kind of underrated really because their fashion was intricate. It was, it was really beautiful, yeah. beautifully made clothes. Yeah. Um, and you see people in Soho dressed like that today, don't you? We just saw somebody, yeah. didn't we, Carrie? We just saw someone absolutely well tailored and manicured with the hat, the zoot suit, the whole look. And I guess it's uh, maybe uh, left over from dan dandyism, isn't it? And, and, uh, yeah, 
probably in 20s, I would think 1920s style, the Blackburn and the, and the you know, the suits where men paid real close attention to yeah. their outward appearances. Yeah. And that, of course, then led Elvis and Little Richard yeah. and the other acts that came out of America. Yeah. So that would have been David's influences. It would have been um, his, his brother and his music and jazz, like same age as my brother. And they were both absent uh, in the forces. Uh, you were conscripted in those days, so you... you, you uh, that was what you had to do, and you could, I think you could um, join the police or something like that, to, to, but you had to do something. Um, and so we both had absent brothers that were into jazz, um, and we were into what was, I suppose, rock and roll, and accessed by David's father, who was worked for Dr. Bonales and got this stuff before anybody else got. But there were radio stations in, 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 in those days which you could hear this stuff. Um, but thank you, America. It was a chink of light. It was really um, an opening into uh, out of this greyness, um, and, and much appreciated. Thank you. I, I don't think I did much of it. <laughs> but then the '60s rolled around, and that must have opened up a whole new world because all these other bands that were very influenced by the American rock and roll and jazz scene burst into the scene in London. So not only the Animals, Dave Clark Five, Beatles, Stones. So where did you guys fall within those new artists in the early '60s? It, it kind of came from it, it came from jazz and it came from blues. Blue, blues was it was uh, the, the the route that you could actually. Also, sorry, I should uh, mention skiffle. Mm -hmm. the, 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 that that's a, a, a form of music which you which is kind of country. But you could, you could, you could uh, knock up a band, or you could knock up an instrument to yeah. be in a band. So you you could, for example, uh, have a, 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 a washboard and go, you know, that's a bit Latin actually, wasn't it? Um, or you could have a, 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 a double bass made from a tea chest, uh, a broom handle, and a piece of string. Mm. Or maybe cat gun. I don't know if you were sophisticated. Uh, and you could have a bass. So that was kind of uh, in parallel with rock and roll. It was it was a kind of a country thing called skiffle, uh, but it gave l a lot of people access to music. And I, I, I think it Robert uh, maybe those yeah, guys. Yeah, I think that Pete Townsend and, and yeah, yeah, a lot, a lot, made a lot their of own instruments. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, so David did that, and my other friend. This is disgusting. I've known since I was four the artist George Underwood. So George, David, and I all grew up together, and George I speak to all the time. Um, we sit at home, and about five o'clock I phone George, or he phones me, and he said, and "We go like, is it time?" And then we have a, a, a pub crawl from the kitchen table, <laughs> which is lovely, which is a lovely thing to do. But to to, to know people from four years of age and eight which I knew David for 60 years, is, is ridiculous, and, and, and as did George. So then going back to um, w w your question about how we met at Blah Blah Early Blah, blah 60s, uh, uh, yeah. uh, uh, we would have got, we, we, we would have been enlisted, actually we'd still be the 50s, we'd enlisted into the choir. Uh, kids were, they did what they were told. So you, you went to the Cubs and the choir, and what else did you do? Sunday school. <laughs> Whatever happened to me, I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and that's what you did. Um, so, uh, and George would have been a part of that as well. So we all grew up together doing that kind of thing. Um, and then you're talking about that in the sixties. So the sixties, David started early, as did George, uh, singing. I used to go and see them at a place in. West Wickham, which is again is in Kent, and at a place called Justin Hall, and they would be uh, in bands doing uh, various things. At one point, David used to go and change. Oh, David was invited into George's band to play saxophone, but quickly pushed the boundaries a bit further and a bit further, <laughs> and ended up singing stuff as well. And uh, at one point he put on a pair of boots and something else and called himself Screaming Something, which obviously came from uh, Screaming, Screaming Jay Hawkins, Jay Hawkins. Yeah. which my mother wouldn't, another one I he put had, a spell on you. which my mother wouldn't let me play. Uh, she said, take that off. <laughs> yeah. 
And she was right, it's the devil's music. Thank goodness. Um, so uh, we, we kind of lost contact for a while and, and I became a mod, first generation mod. And our thing was soul music. And you couldn't get it uh, without getting it on import. So you'd, uh, and sometimes you'd go to a record company, you'd, you'd like the cover and you'd think, oh, well, that, that'll do, that looks great. And you'd take it home and you'd get an organ recital by James Brown. Now, Believe me, the Hammond organ isn't James Brown's first axe. Uh, so you'd make those mistakes, whatever. Or you'd go to, um, uh, I was going to say Kingston, but it wasn't Kingston, it was, Ju uh, it was Jamaican stuff, but it was in uh, Brixton, Brixton Market. And you'd uh, stand there with a lot of other people, and you'd put your hand up if you, if you like something. So Jamaican uh, music came into it. it came, and, and Jamaican music came from Calypso to Blue Beat, Ska, whatever came, th came through that. So that was our other kind of music that we loved. Yeah. Well, it was, it was a lot of uh, rebuilding England in many ways. Yeah. And the people who were, who were encouraged to come here uh, brought their music. Yeah, yeah. Uh, much to everyone's benefit. Yeah. So. And, and if you liked the music, you were accepted into any Jamaican situation. So they'd have blues parties in maybe Somerleyton Street uh, Road in uh, in, uh, in Brixton or uh, even in Lewisham or whatever you you know any, any anywhere there were there were a lot of uh, Caribbean people and you you just walk in and if you if you if you like the vibe that was fine that was fine and and you know, it's this kind of thing where, which we know now that music can draw people together uh, and yeah. music can form lifelong friendships. Sure, sure, but um, at, at that point, David and George were doing their other thing. I think they were trying to get record deals, mm. whereas I didn't even consider that at the yeah. time. What you were know. you doing at the time? What was I doing? Oh, God, you could Besides get, being a mom. Besides being a mom, well, that was the most important thing. <laughs> so, uh, I'll get it. Uh, <laughs> send our love. <laughs> That's all right. It's good. Yeah. Actually, it's a good point. My mic is I love this. Is that the kids? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's good. I like it. I do. I do like it. Uh, what, we, what was I dri were, dribbling were, on about? You were, you were a mod making the stage. Oh, I was a mod, yes, yes. Now, uh, in the early 60s, you could walk out of a, uh, one job and, and, uh, and into another job. It wouldn't be a career-defining moment, but it would... It, it would what, what you have to remember is that we were the first uh, part of youth that didn't do what it was told. So... Um, I, I would turn up on a Sunday after being out from Friday, uh, still chewing Wrigley's gum to a tooth powder, uh, with my mother saying, are you okay? Why aren't you eating your dinner? You know. <laughs> uh, so so we, were, we, we were the first, I suppose, spoiled generation. We could walk out of one job and, 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 and go into another job. Um, there was plenty of work around. Um, once you'd given your mother your housekeeping money, you spent the rest on clothes. Um, music. Music, yeah. And in drugs. In <laughs> I was going to say entertainment. Yeah, I, I, I was trying to think of another word for drugs, but there isn't, is there, to be honest. Let's just get straight to the point. Um, so did, you see, did you see a lot of music? Did you? Did yeah, you yeah, 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 yeah. As you, I think, asked before about um, music evolving in London, um, it, which tipped its hat very much to blues in America. Yeah, well, I'm, most musicians were cover bands yeah, yeah. at that time. That's right. Uh, yeah, and music was uh, all cover stuff. Um, but this was the first time that music or English music had defined itself. And more than defined itself, it had sold itself back to America. Um, and I suppose who would have known uh, the, the, the tracks that we, we, we sold them? They wouldn't have, they, they were, the, the good thing was 
apart from people making money out of old blues artists, mm. is what they, they were valued uh, and they were brought over to, to, to this country. And they might have been a janitor or something. <laughs> Somebody came up to them and said, look, your, your music's out in, in London and people want to see you. And then they were put on a plane and then adored at once they land, landed by, by us. Uh, and they must have been, it must have been a really freaky thing because yeah. they were kind of washed up. They'd never made any money out of their music. All of a sudden they had a value and an audience. And uh, it wasn't just here, it was, it was, it was France as well. Paris uh, loved, loved the blues and jazz. And jazz. Uh, and we championed um, soul music. Yeah. Did you well, see well, a lot well, of Motown at that point? Because I know the Motown, you know. Motown wasn't really the real deal. Mm. It's good to dance to. I don't mind a bit but of But it ain't Otis Redding. No. Um, and that early stuff, which my daughter's here, Irena Mancini, and she plays um, my old stuff, which is the 60s uh, R&B uh, and soul music, which is great. And uh, uh, it was snobbery, you know. Mm. Um, it had to be back. So the only white uh, artists were like Georgie Fame, who used to uh, do a lot of uh, interesting, in, in, interesting uh, black music or blues music or jazz music, mm -hmm. like Mood is Mood for Love, or he would do Mose Allison, who was white, obviously. Um, or there'd be uh, Alexis Corner, uh, and the the the. the Players that became huge later, like Clapton and Beck, um, they were all in band, small bands. Uh, playing small venues. Playing small venues, playing pubs like in Bromley or whatever, that yeah, David yeah. and I would go and see, whatever. Um, so the, 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 the birth of the English scene came, came, from, came from them, Lexus Hall, yeah. Horner or... Yeah. Well, the, those bands, and and then it, we kind of sold it back to America. Mm. But um, I must say, the division between the mods and other music was we were very very snobbish about what we listened to, and our gods were like James Brown and uh, Otis Redding, and any, anything to do with Stax or that kind of thing, um, and we had. Doris Troy singing Just One Look. When the Hollies had a hit in the charts in England. So, and then the Stones might do something, um, but we had the original. Mm. So, yeah, we were a bit, we were snobs, really, about, about that and about yeah. the origins yeah. of, the, 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 you know. You were and passionate, passionate about music. We were passionate about, a bit, a bit narrow-minded, to be honest. Yes, yeah. yes. All great passion is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. Nice yeah, yeah, yeah. So when when did David start playing you his music, and then you thought, hmm, there's something here. Always. Yeah. However, um, I don't think it was until say Van Morrison uh, and Astral Weeks, for example, that I ever heard. A white black singer. That is to say, somebody wasn't aping a black singer, mm. but had that um, uh, rawness. Um, so so that, that would have been one. Mm. Um, we always loved. Oh, there were there were, there were things that crossed over uh, 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 that everybody loved, which were brilliant. Um, and that was Brian Wilson, that was the Beach Boys. Mm -hmm. So Pet Sounds and that stuff and Surf's Up. It, pff, to this day, you put it on and uh, there's music you put on. I'm sure you do it, I'm sure you do it. There's music you put on from 100 years ago or whatever and it's like, or it comes on the radio and you just, excuse me, you, up it goes. 
Um, so the, it, it, it's, a, it's an odd thing, and some of it's terrible. Like Louis Louis by The Kingsman is one of the greatest tracks ever written. It's terrible. <laughs> Yet we all know it. Yet we all know it, and yeah. it comes on the radio, boom, up it goes. Yeah. It puts people in a good mood, doesn't it? It does. Yeah. There's something, there's something sonic there that just, just. Yeah. 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 What was the first album you started to work on <coughs> with him? I think it was uh, that insane. Mm -hmm. Um, and but, how, how did that come about? I mean, because so, yeah. my, my mate's in the studio doing something and uh, we do some vocals. Mm -hmm. And it's ludicrous uh, to say that I don't remember working on an album with David Bowie, as big as Aladdin Sane, but I don't. And the fact is I probably never, I probably didn't even charge him for it, or anybody for it. I probably just was hanging around and did that. And, uh, and it's not something I particularly remember because it was so natural just to help out, whatever. So it wasn't like a session, a paid session fee where you, know, you go in and you're paid and you've still got the tab and the receipt for it. Um, and apparently I played uh, congas and uh, percussion on Panic in Detroit because Woody had uh, uh, a disagreement with David about how it should be done. Uh, but I don't remember that either, so... <laughs> but, yeah, that's, yeah, apparently I did all that. <clears throat> but before that, when David's music started to get airplay and David became more and more known and famous for his music. Did you, you know, watch him on TV and think, that's amazing, that's my childhood friend? Absolutely, yeah, and it was like, oh, Dave, you know. Well done. Um, yeah, I remember being in, in the kitchen. We, for some reason, we all lived in Beckenham after Bromley. My mother uh, bought a, 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 an apartment in, uh, uh, in Beckenham near Haddon Hall, where David uh, lived, and uh, I remember being in the kitchen and hearing "Can't Help Thinking About Me" uh, uh, on the radio, and it being introduced, and we were so excited, you know, because that was one of my nice friends. He was very polite, David, when he was young. You know. <laughs> well, he always was. He was always really charming. You know that. I mean, you've seen him. Um, he was. He. Uh, so that was would be the first time. Um, and then the, the, the second wave was, was uh, in 71, 2, um, and then it was Life on Mars. And Life on Mars is just brilliant. It's just brilliant. <laughs> it's not like your mates on the radio. Your, your mates on the radio doing something fucking brilliant. You know, so it's, uh, th that, that was the second time. I was living in Notting Hill then, and... Um, my girlfriend at the time worked at Feathers. And Feathers was owned by the uh, uh, S Sydney and, and his wife Joan, who eventually bought Browns of South, Mal South Malton Street. So, uh, and there were two brothers, Sydney and Willie Burst, Burst, Burstein. And uh, they went, they, we used to take clothes down for, for Andrew and David to, from, from Feathers. So that, those little jackets, the nylon jackets that the band wore in all different colours came, came from Feathers. So we kind of helped out on that, on that thing. And I had no intentions of uh, being in his band or whatever, uh, or doing anything like that. Although he did get me to, he did write a song for me and, and George and all his friends, because he wanted to take them on the journey, you know. So I went on the journey. Another route. How camp is that? Come on. <laughs> Be beyond okay. camp. <laughs> a hell of a head of hair. <laughs> Look at that. That's amazing. Still have it. Thank Still you. got it. So, okay, so then you're now in the early 70s. You're one of your best childhood friends has made it. Not only made it, but made it with style and integrity and doing something amazing and new how do you get up on stage how did that come about um it wasn't an invitation mm. <coughs> so that's the difference mm -hmm. 
uh, an invitation gives you the opportunity to say, no, I don't want to do that. When you're told you're in a band and now we're going to be doing this, or you're told you're going to sing a song at Radio City Music Hall or whatever it is or whatever, you, you kind of do it. Did you just think, well, I'll do that. I'll go along for that ride, see what happens. That'll be fun. The, what's the option? The option is saying no and being a real dunce, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, and the only time I, I actually said no to David is when he asked me to do a reading at his wedding. And I was at the top of my game, actually. I, I, I'd, I had a production company. We had a, a, a hit with one of our car ads or something. And it went, went to number three or whatever, you know. And I, and I was recording it. And he said, would you do a reading at my wedding? And I went, no. <laughs> That's the only time. Because he gave me the option. Yeah. So yeah. had he given me the option in those days to say no, maybe I'd have said no. Mm. But instead, he went on the road. Um, instead, I went on the road. I, I did do with the reading, by the way. I pulled myself together and, <laughs> and manned up. Uh, but uh, yeah, I went on the road. Um, what was the first tour? Do you, do you remember first that? tour. The first tour was a freebie. Mm. It was like standing in the wings and watching the show for nothing, and maybe playing a bit of whatever and, bo and backing vocal it was me and John Hutchinson which Hutch it was a band called Feathers he was in with his long lost love Hermione and uh, John and I did backing vocals he, him on rhythm guitar and I did percussion and uh, backing vocals and there were uh, a couple of brass uh, not a brasses, no, <laughs> a, a, couple, a brass section. <laughs> God, right. Stop it, it's your fault. Uh, of two uh, who'd been working, you know, at Heathrow Airport or something just before that. And we were at the side of the stage and Mike Carson was on, on the other side. And as it should have been, excuse me, it was um, the spiders doing their thing and we were kind of just backing it up so it was a nice introduction to show business mm. standing on the side of the stage up until the point that his retirement in uh, at the uh, at Hammersmith Odeon mm. um, and it was kind of a freebie it was like it was like joining in from the side of the stage almost um, yeah so so had had he asked me to be like a diamond dog and do like dancing around a mime and whatever whatever right. um, directly, may, maybe I, I wouldn't have picked up the vibe and it, it would have been more difficult. But uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, he told you what to do. He didn't ask you. That's yeah. the, that's yeah. what I'm getting at. Mm. <laughs> Apart from the wedding thing, which he asked me. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But then, how did you going on the road? You being sort of you know backing vocals and 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 drums and, and also a, a, a bit of dancing uh, um, how did that turn into collaboration on songwriting because you you do have credit on some songs accidental yes yeah I was uh, David lived in Oakley Street in, in Chelsea uh, in, in a oh, rent, rent, rented a, a huge five-story house and I I didn't have uh, anything to do I was a bit bored so I thought I'd and annoy David and uh, he was uh, this this place had a, I think a grand piano on the on, on the ground floor but it had another uh, smaller room upstairs with a with an upright piano and he was working on an idea at the time and I made some coffee and we sat down and chewed the fat whatever and then I got on the piano and started playing this half-assed thing melody that I started to do and he went, hang, hang on a minute, do that again. So I've got these credits. Never got anything for them, of course, you know, David's management took all that. But, you know, it's, who cares? It's, you know, it's not the point, is it? Your the point is, <laughs> got a track on Diamond Dogs and a track on yeah. Us For Life. You can't put a number on it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> well, you can. Exactly. Exactly. Well, through your travels you with, with David, do you need water, Ben? No, be, be very yeah. slow when you ask this. <laughs> <laughs> I could ask a lot of questions. Um, 
But I, I'm curious, so you toured a lot with David. You appeared with him on stage, back in vocals. We were watching um, video in the back there of the Dick Cavett show with you in a, in a fabulous jumpsuit with um, Ava. And uh, when did you decide, you know, I'm going to bring my camera and I'm going to start taking photos of my friend. And did you do it as sort of, you know, when, I mean, when, when I was when I was a kid and I was traveling around with my best friend, we took photos of each other. Exactly. But neither one of us turned out to be David Bowie. Was it that idea? Or did you think, I need to start recording this? Uh, I'm the kind of person who has done things and earned money from them and done them well, mm -hmm. but never really know, known what I wanted to do. Uh, for five minutes, I, I thought it would be fun to get into photography. It just happens to be the right five minutes <laughs> that I made that decision. Um, when we got to uh, Japan from the first uh, show shows we did in 1973. Yeah, and you took uh, the train, correct? Am I wrong with that? <laughs> no, we, we we went by boat and then took and and tracks trains across America. Cross, yeah, yeah, or or limo, whatever. Yeah, I I got uh, uh, the great photographer Sakita to get me trade a Nikon, but something that a, a fool could use. Uh, it was actually pretty difficult to use a Nikon mat. They weren't that easy, to be honest. It's yeah. not like your phone or whatever. But anyway, so I got a Nikon mat in uh, Tokyo. Mm -hmm. trade mm -hmm. that Sakita got got me and the first decent photograph I took is of David uh, on the Trans-Siberian Express because we couldn't he didn't fly so we had to get uh, a, a boat to uh, uh, just beyond Vladivostok a place called Nahotka uh, Vladivostok was then a military zone and you weren't allowed anywhere near it. So we got onto the, the, the uh, Trans-Siberian Express and it was beautiful. It was uh, a, a beautiful uh, French built uh, ship with um, I, um, a French built ship, wooden, whatever, whatever. But that was the, like the ferry, the ferry ship that yeah. took us to the, 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 the main plastic uh, trans Siberian Express, mm -hmm. and the first shot I took of it was out, outside uh, one of those carriages with the, with the emblem uh, and, and, and him, that was, and that was the first one I took. Yeah. And and the rest, are just like you 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 were saying, it's like uh, the holiday snaps. Hmm. They are holiday snaps, basically. Yeah. And that's why I say Carrie uh, edited a lovely book. Uh, I think it might be here somewhere, and it's uh, David Bowie icon. And it's got some some, some lovely, uh, lovely stuff from from all great photographers. She asked to include me, but I, I had to fess up and say I'm I'm an imposter in this book because I'm not a photographer. My my photos absolutely b belong there, and I'm glad they're there because mm -hmm. David loved loved them too. So I'm quite happy with my photos. Mm -hmm. But to call myself a photographer would be, or a singer, or a mm -hmm. dancer, or a you're a bit of everything. <laughs> yeah. But they're yeah. beautiful photos. I mean, they're just very relaxed, very casual, very two friends happen to be on this train journey. Th they are, and uh, uh, I've uh, come to uh, appreciate them uh, more now than, than, than ever before. Uh, and I found some more. I've got, I've got this show in, Bri uh, in, in Brighton Museum Gallery, and uh, my wife and I found uh, some, some stuff that I hadn't even considered and it's really, it's really great. And uh, I would take maybe three pictures of something or two or one. So it wouldn't be like a session photographer that took like reels and reels of them with, you know, whatever. And I'm just amazed and delighted. Well, the subject is br brilliant, but let's, let's face it. Um, so I'm really amazed that uh, I have them. And... Uh, I think rather than singing, dancing, mining, writing, or whatever, it's the best contribution I could have made to. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, it's your visual, it's your visual history it is, of it is. that time. Yeah, yeah. yeah now, yeah. was this was this photo on the Man Who Earth? 
Is it is, yeah. I must have given my camera to, 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 to somebody. Yeah. Uh, my then girlfriend or whatever, and, and she fired off a couple. And there's another one which is an even camper than this. <laughs> uh, and and the, the, I've got half a dozen pictures of me and David, uh, whatever, from a, either other people were using my camera. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's, it's just so silly. I mean, that's how silly. Yeah, that's too. too so, so, in terms of uh, shoving a camera up his nose every every no, I, I, it, I wouldn't do it, and it, it would have been. I had a lot long a cheap lens, a Vivitar lens, which I used two hundred, and I, I I took a lot of the shots like that. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I wouldn't be in the stills photographer's way or anybody's anybody's way. So yeah. I, I'd rather take it like that. Yeah. So, uh, uh, when did you go off the road, if you will? When did you? St really kind of go back and refocus on your career and and then David went off to do his own thing at the moment? I didn't have a career. I had a panic. <laughs> uh, 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 I, I think one of the things I, I, I got from, from, from that, from touring or whatever, is that, you know what, you can do stuff. <laughs> you don't have to, if you're good at something, you don't have to go to school to embellish it. You, you can learn on the way, mm. on the hoof. Uh, so I started a production company with somebody I met uh, in the Three Tums, of course, in Beckenham, which was the home of uh, <coughs> David's Arts Lab, um, uh, and the pub, of course. Uh, and we, um, we started a songwriting together. Um, and it had a purpose. I, I, I was going to be a singer, not that I wanted to be, but it was a gig. Mm. And then when that kind of faded out, and the, and the, and the advances faded out, there was, a lot, there was interest, uh, there was a lot of interest, and the advances faded out, um, I thought, well, maybe we should uh, do music for a uh, music production company, you know, for hire, whatever. Uh, and we did that, and we won a major reward in America, it was like called a gold clear, mm. which was... Yeah, yeah, massive, it was, it was massive. <laughs> Yeah. And then it went on, and then we worked with all these incredible directors, you know, like the Scott Brothers and uh, uh, people that did big films and whatever. So we started doing that and doing film scores and whatever. Mm. And yeah, Ivan Novello and all that stuff. And you know, so we did, we did really well. And then it hits, you know, it was just silly. Hits in Italy, a bit, top five here, you know, and uh, album deals and whatever. And it was good because you could hide away uh, by doing that as well. You didn't have to be uh, known. Yeah. Uh, you could. It's, it's a kind of anonymous, but yeah. you could still have success anonymously, which is kind of nice. Yeah. Yeah. But you guys obviously kept in touch the whole time. Yeah, we've always, yeah. We always kept in touch. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Always kept in touch. <clears throat> what did you think of his music after you left the backing band? I mean, what you know, obviously he he went on, recorded you know, yeah. brilliant music and kept touring and, and pushing the boundaries in terms of what he was doing. Um, did you call him up and just think, you know, well done that, or did you? Sorry, just waving at my tears. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not a Bowie fan, so. Do you know what I mean? I, I, I am a fan. I think mm -hmm. it's brilliant. I mean, yeah. it's, you know, and, and um, there was a point uh, in time when he stood on stage by himself with the spotlight and Mike Garson singing Life on Mars. And it was one of the most incredible things I've ever seen. But I'm not a Bowie fan, so I wasn't waiting for his next album. Right. Although I got him for nothing. Yeah. Um, so, do you know, I'm quite ignorant of his music, to be honest mm -hmm. with you. Um, I, don't, I, 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 I don't know yeah. what Tin Machine album by album or mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and yes yeah, so uh, there are various things that, that, that I, I loved ab about it I mean I think his his whole thing was experimental mm. so it wasn't it wasn't like you were going to get some of the same yeah and did. it wasn't that it was lesser or or, or more, but it, it's a sonic thing. And if you it, if there's a sonic thing that comes through, mm -hmm. um, I mean, heroes, it's just unbelievable. It's yeah. just how how can you come up with that stuff? It's yeah. so wonderful, you know. Yeah. 
Yeah. So I'm a fan, but I'm not a fan waiting for the, the next. Well, you had an inside track, didn't you? I yeah, mean, you yeah. Had, you had a very... When you know someone that well, and you're a schoolmate, it, 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 yeah. there's some kind of um, familiarity which disallows you to, to separate yourself yeah. from that. Yeah. So, yeah. I think when you know someone when you're nine... Eight. Eight. <laughs> And four with George, it's and, but, yeah, yeah, I mean, no, that, I think it's just a it's different, ridiculous. it's a different sort of um, relationship that you have with the individual, no matter what they do in their lives, whether yeah. they're building a building or, or, or recording number it is. one album. It is. It's yeah. another thing. It's a. Yeah. It's. It seems almost normal that they should be doing that. It's like uh, destiny. Yeah. 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 Um. Uh, why didn't you want to read at his wedding? You're such a natural... I was scared. I was scared looking out <laughs> to a sea of the greatest uh, rock stars and fashion people and yeah, yeah. Uh, whatever mm -hmm. when he was facing the other way. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Um, Because he said, do it, you know, I, 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 I kind of, of course, you yeah, know. Of course, you, know, you had to. Of course. Yeah. And when I did it, it was fine. It yeah. was good. It's a church, you know, it's got echo. Mm. It's got gravitas. Mm. Mm. <laughs> What's it like now? Because you do have, you have a, a terrific show uh, down in Brighton that runs till the end of January. Uh, what's it like for you now, looking at the body of work that you did produce in terms of the, your, your years together when you were on the road, when you were a spider? Um, <coughs> Does it bring, what, what type of memories, does it just bring back crazy times and crazy memories of, of like, the, I mean, I, you know, I'm, I love the fashion aspect of it because it is, you know, the shoulder pads and the Freddie Beretti and, and what everybody wore and how spot on the style was. What, what type of memories does it bring back to you today? Uh, I think really the whole thing is kind of surreal. Mm. So it was like a, 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 a party that lasted three years. <laughs> And every now and again, you'd go back home to your mum's and you'd have a wash up and change your clothes, and maybe, you'd, and then you'd go back to the party. Uh, so there was no, there's nothing really tangibly realistic, or it's not like do, do doing a good job or going to work or whatever. Um, so it, and it was somebody else's, but I, I I kind of pride myself on taking it up and doing it and doing it with some degree of, obviously. <laughs> um, but, yeah, it's kind of surreal, really. The whole thing's kind of surreal. Mm. And I think the whole thing about uh, Bowie being ba Bowie and not David Jones is surreal. Um, and I think he never had a plan. <laughs> uh, and that's what makes it work so fresh all the time and mm -hmm. so yeah yeah he he, he didn't uh, he didn't want to do the same thing as my good friend george underwood said um he was very brave and i think that's mm. that's what it is yeah yeah good way to end um i do want to uh save time for questions i'm sure you guys have a lot of things that you want to ask jack um any questions Bill? Yeah. Uh, what was it like working on the Pinups album, and what are your recollections of Rick Rock? Mm. Um, so Mick was. Let's start with him because he, he was there early on. Um, we were just talking about Mick actually, yes. <clears throat> obviously, um, and he was beautiful. He was a really, in a weird way. Um, well, you called him a pre-Raphaelite. Pre-Raphaelite. That's what he had. He was, yeah. He was. He was. He was quite beautiful, in a weird way, and uh, he he was a he looked like he was in a band. So he was like. Um, so he wasn't like uh, somebody who was doing that job of, which is a little bit distant. 
photographing from the other side of a camera. He was like a mate. Um, uh, and uh, he would have been there early on. In fact, there's a picture, excuse me, in my show. We've just had a, a, a I had a glass of beer earlier. And it's <laughs> repeating, <laughs> repeating. Um, so he would have been there uh, when David and I went off in 73 on the Canberra. There's a picture in my show of uh, David. Oh, God, he, he's got women's clothes on. We wore women, women's clothes in those days. I, I just tore over there uh, uh, the Dick Cavett show, and I've got a, 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 a girl's jumpsuit on, uh, <laughs> probably high heels or something, and it's like, you know. So, so, so Mick, Mick, Mick yeah, he, he was uh, around from the early days, and he was one of the band, band basically. He wasn't a, a photographer. Uh, and uh, yeah, and he remained friends with David for, for a long time. What was the other question you asked me? Pin ups. Just working on pin ups because Mick did the, the back cover for that album. He that. did, he did. Um, pin ups, I really had very little to do with, uh, apart from doing backing vocals and having a good time going in and out of Paris. Um, but uh, I've got a couple of shots of that, I think, which are in the exhibition. There's Mick Ronson. Mick was so clever. I've got a picture of him. Uh, he did the strings section, a quartet. Um, probably for something like Sorrow, maybe, which were beautiful. I mean, it's just, just done beautifully. He was so smart. So I think I remember mostly Mick Ronson being brilliant. Um, Lulu came over and, and she to the, the man who who not felt off, who um, oh, dropped his was it anyway and uh, you look very stern sir are you okay sorry any any other questions yes sir. So I was lucky enough to see Bowie in 73, my first gig, and I, probably with you on the side of the stage. Yeah, yeah, but on the side. And <laughs> since then, I saw all the tours, apart from Diamond Dogs, which has always been one of these mystical tours. And has there is there a film of Diamond Dogs that you know of? Because it seems like it was such a theatrical presentation, mm -hmm. and it seems strange that nobody ever filmed the whole mm -hmm. show, so that in later generations we could see it and enjoy it. It is a shame. You get you, you get bits and bobs of it. So you've got the idea, you've seen enough of it to get the idea yeah. of how, how, how the movement was. Well you see clips on YouTube of just little tiny stuff. Yeah, yeah, yes. Sometimes in black and white, sometimes No, in it's color. a real shame. And there are rumours that Main Man had the whole thing filmed. No, I don't think it happened. Oh, really? No, no, he, he would have, the, the manager would have sold it by now. <laughs> Twice. <laughs> Twice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so you're right, but on the other hand of the coin, it it's kind of cool, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, <laughs> this yeah. unknown thing, uh, did it happen or not? But I, I, I think what it was, it was the most expensive uh, show made, and it was the first theatrical show um, with, with, with props and flats and moving parts. There was a bridge that moved up and down. There was a cherry picker that moved into the audience, blah, blah, blah. Um, and it was just too expensive to tour. I think that, and that's, that's what it was. And David changed his mind. He was into soul music then. Yeah. 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 A difficult man to manage, I would have, I would have thought. But you, you were... Well, yeah, you were in a recording studio for Young Americans. I yeah, like I've seen those. Yeah, photos. Yeah, yeah, every, every yeah. now and again, yeah. and uh, with Luther. Luther, yeah, what a yeah! Beautiful. I remember Luther sitting down at a piano and playing some stuff and going, "Excuse me." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, brilliant, brilliant, Absolutely. and very shy. He was very unsure of himself at that point. Mm -hmm. So that must have done a lot of good because David uh, said, "Put this." Uh, uh, this warm-up show, which we, we which we did, um, and uh, yeah, Luther got everybody to sing his songs. Not not me, because I that was a, I did I did, I did something else. Um, I did a jazz number. Anyway, um, but 
it must have done in the world of good, Luther, to, uh, although this was, this was your question, uh, to have done that. Um, but he was a very shy, shy, sh shy guy. So, so, so um, what with Robin Clark, who's wonderful, who's Carlos's wife, who's, uh, we loved, me, me and Guy the other diamond, we absolutely adored her. Um, I think they, they, they set him off on his career. And he, he, was, he was great when, uh, uh, when he was at the top of his game, Luther. He was really cool. Yeah, yeah. amazing voice. Amazing, amazing voice. voice. But I mean, that took courage to, to be able to, 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 to sing like that in front of the, the good and the great. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, you're obviously a very, very good friend of David Bowie's, and you're a very humble man, it would seem. You don't come across as like starry or anything like that. And David was famous for being able to switch it on and switch it off. What was that like being around him when he, when he was off and then when he was off? Mm -hmm. Were you ever there when he managed to just turn it on and then people saw him? Always. <laughs> <laughs> um... I think it was the way we were brought up. We were brought up as polite Bromley kids who who had manners. <coughs> um, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, it's not poncy. It's, it's cool. It's nice to make people, hopefully, feel at ease and whatever. There's nothing apart from these poor children who, who this poor young girl who's so bored. Uh, I, I apologise. I apologise. You may do this to to your to your kids one day. Who knows? That's yeah. Um, I just wondered I, if, um, because when you see David Bowie being interviewed, yes, he's always polite. But there were some really inane interviews with him where they kind of completely, especially in like the early days in the English press and then the first kind of American interviews. And I really love the Dick Cavett interviews. I think he's... Do you? I do. I think he's kind of funny with Dave. I don't know. I do like it. But um, I just wondered if David ever commented on those. Never. He was always kind of... Did them and that was no, I think he enjoyed the the, the, the latter stuff, like with, with Jonathan Ross or whatever, where, the, where, where there was yeah. more of a rapport. I, I don't know what kick he was on, David. Well, I do, but I mean, I don't know what he th thought he was doing with it. No, so I hate that. Bye bye. Yeah. Um, uh, but it, it's theatre, isn't it? I suppose it, it's uh, with his stick and his, uh, and his yeah. the whole thing. I don't know. It's it's. I don't know. I mean, he was just always so funny and so gracious. Yeah, I think he got good at it. I think he got really good at um, at doing interviews. Mm. I think he got better as, as time went on. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. First of all, I live next door to Bromley, and the boys aren't polite anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to ask about your show. Went to see it. I thought it was joyous. I really enjoyed it. But you mentioned that you'd found some more photos, so do I need to go back again? Will you be adding? I should say yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes. I did also buy a print. Just oh, which one did you buy? Arms up. Oh, I love that one. Love Dirty it. fingernails, I love, love that. Arm, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's a good one. That white t-shirt. <laughs> I know. No, we've finally... Um, Got everything, but I, there was so much more than I, I, I could imagine. And, and funnily enough, you've been to the show. Yeah. Excuse me, beer. <laughs> Wasn't the wine. Um, you've been to the show, so you 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 will know that I've used what I had on my Instamatic camera. Yeah. And th th they have a value as well because the the the, 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 the gallery said uh, Martin Pell, who's the curator at the gallery, said. You must use your your instamatic shots as well. And we're going to put them in uh, in uh, smaller uh, under the big pictures. We'll, yeah. we'll we'll display them like that. And I didn't want that idea because I thought it looked like um, a bit like a science museum, you know. But they actually work really well. And all those scrappy little yeah. uh, shots of, of of you know like uh, Woody Woodmansey and Trevor Boulder and David and Mike Garson being on a station in Tokyo going to whatever or somewhere else in Japan going no, no one else had those so it's uh, 
instamatic shots, those men going back to holiday snaps, isn't it? Um, they're, they're really important. Yeah, it's joyful. Thank I, you. I, I did worry, um, my friend Stuart and I went, I did worry I'd be upset, actually. Um, and it wasn't, it was really uplifting. Yeah, yeah. It's, that's what it's about, isn't it, really? Yeah. Silly, silly stuff. Friendships. Two friends on the road. That's right. Yeah. Thelma and Louise. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yes, sir. The Society for Long Hair, were you a member of the Society? <laughs> no, I didn't believe in long hair. I was a mod, remember? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so what do you think of David when he did that? Um... <laughs> no comment. <laughs> Wasn't your scene, man. Um, another question? Because I'm gonna I'm gonna ask about because you know obviously I I work in photography so I'm curious what like I mean you had such early access to the beginnings of amazing photographers' careers like Sukita, uh, uh, of course Mick Roth. Um, but then you must have been there when some of the more older guard, like Terry O'Neill, would come by and, and start taking photos. I mean, did you think, well, I could take photos? I mean, how did the, could you, you're good friends with Chris Duffy, of course, Brian Duffy's son. Uh, I, I, I knew I didn't know what I was doing. It, and, and that's not the point, it, it doesn't really matter. It's what comes out at the end, and that's fine. But, so I, I, I thought I, uh, I might carry, carry it on. I was asked by um, Steve Shapiro in Los Angeles if I would be his assistant. And in, in, in a perfect world, I, I would have done that. And, and what, li year, lived what year in, was this? Uh, that would have been 75, okay. at the end of 75. So if, if, uh, Steve Shapiro, if you guys, I'm sure you guys know who he is, but um, uh, American photographer, very famous for doing a lot of uh, civil rights. Mm -hmm. He was on Selma, mm -hmm. but then and did a lot of movie photography. He was on Taxi Driver, Midnight Cowboy, and then of course had a, a great working relationship with mm -hmm. David mm -hmm. amongst everybody. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so Steve asked me uh, uh, if I'd like to uh, be his assistant. And, and, and I would have done, but it was Los Angeles and it was 1975 and um, it was a bit hedonistic. I wouldn't have survived it and I'd have let him down and I wouldn't have liked to have let him down because he, he was a wonderful guy uh, who narrated um, some of the most important parts of Amer American history ever and it would have been terrible. But when I came back to London and sorted my head out a bit, I did ask Brian Duffy, if I could assist him. And Brian said, if you work in a color lab for a couple of years, you can come be my assistant. And I said, sure. But my brain said, fuck that. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> when did you first decide to do the exhibition of Brighton? And how did you know what photos to leave out? Um, okay, so I started to do shows in 2018 and did one here and one in Lee, uh, one in Lee, sorry, where, where uh, uh, Leon C, one in uh, Lucy Bell's down in St. Leonard's and one in uh, St. Petersburg. Uh, and then, of course, the pandemic hit. And, but we'd organised this already with the, the curator, who's from South End, obviously, so it's where we live, who's from South End as well, and we'd, we'd organised this already. So it, we got in, in there just at the right time. Um, That's wonderful. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That's a good place to end for now. Thank you so much for doing this. I'm done.